to see you all. So I'm Tom Locker and I'm in the physics department here and I'll be a, an MC for the day. Uh, this is our seventh annual Collaborating for Education and Research Forum. Uh, this, has been, uh, this has been a great run and I'll tell you a little bit about it. As soon as I point out to you, not only that we've got this colored booklet in your folders that you picked up, but that there is a list of sponsors on the back. And I wanted to begin just by thanking all of them. Uh, this is the College of Science is the heavy lifter here uh, in, in uh, helping us with all this. Not only are we in their home, but uh, in many other respects. Uh, they provide logistical support for the forum. Uh, the College of Engineering, uh, Matt Closer Center for STEM Education. Uh, Mitch Wayne is the director of the Corknet Center and is, is here. He's done all of the sponsorship arrangements, et cetera. Uh, university uh, communications helped some, and due to a mistake on my part, so did uh, the Office of Public Affairs, which is a little bit different than university communications, and I simply left them off the list. But I want to thank all of them and all of you uh, for making this event possible. It would have been not a lot of fun without all of you here, so thanks so much for coming. And thank you all. You all don't know each other. Many of you know one another. You travel in different circles, in parts of different communities. And this event for seven years has been about trying to foster STEM community. Lots of folks who do know one another, but if we can represent the various circles that we're from this way, in STEM education, sometimes it's the case that the folks in research don't know anybody in K-12 education, and vice versa. That uh, we've been working hard to overcome that state of affairs here for a number of years. And this has been the heart and soul of the forum. We've dropped in collaboration activities of all sorts, and we showcase them. We showcase them in here in presentations, out there in, in meet and greets, ar around tables, etc. But there's a big piece of a fully integrated STEM community that we have not really paid sufficient attention to prior to now. And, and we began to make up for that a little bit when we brought in last, the last time we were here, we, we pulled in uh, and Focus, which is a fellowship program, sort of a postgraduate fellowship program right at the intersection of research and commercialization uh, and education, but also uh, MSTCI, which is a, a math science technology center, uh, which is looking to do the same sort of thing. And lots of folks all over the community are trying to pull together various elements of the community so that we work better together. And this is what we're going to do today. Um, we are going to look at Project Lead the Way. We're going to look at some five county uh, or some uh, county-wide initiatives uh, in three of our regional counties. Uh, and there will be a lot of people that you don't know, no matter who you are, because we really are in, in a community that is in some ways fractured and could do better if we work uh, to, together more closely. So that's what we're up to today. To kick us off, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Sean Peters. Sean is the Vice President and General Counsel for Union uh, Station Technology Center. He's the former president of the Corporate uh, Partnership for Economic Growth, or CPEG. Uh, CPEG is a regional uh, coalition of business leaders uh, dedicating to, dedicated to pulling together uh, resources from throughout a region, uh, throughout a five county region. And Sean remains the acting president of this effort, but what you might not know from his bio is that Sean has really done an enormous amount of the heavy lifting in, in looking into uh, trying to increase project-based learning uh, in, this, in this region, uh, having done some research on best practices, and he has uh, is quite a bit responsible, actually, for the opportunities uh, that we'll learn about this morning. So, without anything further, Mr. Sean Peters. Tom, I, uh, I thank you and thank the University of Notre Dame for your leadership in promoting STEM education throughout the, the five county region. 
Well, uh, it is fitting that the venue for today involves a forum of those who have been on the front lines of promoting our nation's competitiveness. Uh, no person outside the family home has the ability to affect, uh, uh, inspire our children, and unlock the creative potential than teachers. And as our nation struggles uh, to regain its competitive advantage and grow our economy, we really need to focus on how do we inspire the next generation of innovators, entrepreneurs, and problem solvers. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, CPEG is a, region of co a coalition of regional business leaders. And on behalf of the organization as partners, I'd like to thank you for the hard work you've been doing to inspire students throughout our area. Now, the national struggle to remain competitive uh, in this global economy is the same struggle we have been facing locally. If you look at the 28 regions that look just like us across the country, we are 27th in the average rate of per capita income growth uh, uh, when you compare them across the board. And that's 27th not just in the last 45 years, but also the last five years. And at a time of, of, uh, of high unemployment, we still had 300 unfilled positions in the, in the STEM fields in our area. Sensing this reality, about 20 months ago, a group of the economic development organizations came together and said, what can we do to increase our local competitiveness? And at the request of Jeff Ray of the St. Joseph County Chamber, uh, Dorin Hyden Gus with the uh, Economic Development Corporation of Elkhart County, uh, George Robertson with the Kosciuszko County Economic Development Corporation, and Jennifer Laurent of the Marshall County Economic Development Corporation, uh, they asked CPEG to commission a study that, of our region's talent drivers. And so we engaged a firm called Thomas P. Miller and Associates and partnered with the Northern Indiana Workforce Development Board to issue um, the talent roadmap for Northern Indiana. This was developed with the collaboration of those organizations as well as uh, detailed interviews with uh, businesses and focus groups. They did a, uh, a quantitative and qualitative analysis and then engaged several education organizations and workforce development professionals to develop uh, key recommendations and drivers that could move this region forward. While the report dealt with the spectrum of the workforce and recommendations across that spectrum, there was one key recommendation that they made for the K-12 space. And that was dramatically increasing the level of project-based STEM-focused learning in our region. In fact, the consultant looked at uh, best practices across the nation. And the one they identified for this space was a group called Project Lead the Way. Project Lead the Way is the nation's leading provider of project-based STEM-focused programming for schools and was named one of the top four STEM organizations in the country. And when we surveyed our economic development partners after the report was released, we asked, what recommendation would be the most transformational? And I remember Jeff Ray saying at a town initiative like expanding Project Lead the Way. And then Greg Vollmer, who was the president of the uh, uh, Northern Indiana Workforce Development Board, said, and took it even a step further, expanding the project-based learning to every school in the region. How's that for a bold vision? Because Project Lead the Way appeared in our report, and through the help of our consultant, we were able to arrange a meeting with their leadership. And in that meeting focused largely upon remediating my lack of understanding of the education system. But at the very end, uh, there was a simple request made. If you ever thought about doing a regional pros, approach, call us. We are fortunate that uh, our region received a call. And my first call was to uh, those individuals who have been education leaders throughout our five county area. Uh, Brian Wiebe with the Horizon Education Alliance, which is developing the gold standard uh, for education in Elkhart. Uh, Cheryl Conley and Brad Bishop of OrthoWorks, who have been working tirelessly to expand STEM education in support of the orthopedic industry in the Warsaw area. Uh, Linda Yoder and, and Dan Tyree of, in Marshall County, who have been working to uh, develop a group called Infuse to expand STEM education uh, throughout the area. And Terry Fulton from Fulton County. Um, Economic Development Corporation. And then in St. Joseph County, 
uh, Kay Ball and her team at the United Way, as well as leaders uh, Larry Davis and Larry Garatoni in the business community. They all gave me one simple response. We had to compete. This was about opportunity. Opportunity to equip our teachers uh, with additional tools to be able to connect with students. Opportunity to train our students for the high paying jobs of tomorrow. And the opportunity to create a robust local talent pipeline. After a site visit of those leaders to Project Lead the Way's headquarters and a visit by their team to our region, uh, the call to action became clear. For us to be competitive as a finalist, we had to demonstrate community support. With the help of all those organizations and individuals, a final package was submitted earlier this month uh, to be uh, a model region for Project Lead the Way. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Vince Bertram, the CEO of Project Lead the Way. You know, Sean mentioned a number of things about Project Lead the Way, but also about America, what this really means for our country. And so the big question that we ask all the time is, why does this matter? I was called to a meeting with one of the world's largest foundations. And they brought 12 people together to talk about STEM education, specifically, and then what we can do at scale. And they, we went around, made introductions, and they asked for any opening questions. My first question was, what is STEM? And a lot of people around the table looked at one another and they said, well, it's science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And that's really not what we're about. You know, Howard Gardner says that the greatest deficit in American education is the inability for our students to apply learning in a context in which it wasn't learned. In America, we teach a mile wide, inch deep. It's about content coverage. We try to do the opposite of both of those things. Rather than looking at these as discrete disciplines, we look at integrated approach and how science, technology, engineering, mathematics define how our world and how our world works, why we exist, and how everything is connected. It brings a relevancy to our work. And the other is rather than a mile wide and inch deep, we try to go deep and to focus really on the depth of learning and helping students really understand not just how to solve an equation to answer a question on a test, but rather how to learn mathematics and science to help solve problems and real world problems. I learned something very important early on in my career, as a, even as a parent of four sons, about relevancy. And I remember it was my son Drew, he was four years old, he was in preschool, and his teacher called and said, we have a concern about Drew in mathematics. He said, so what is the concern? Well, today we asked him a question, and we're not sure that he knew the answer. The question was, Drew, if you have 24 pencils and I take six away, how many pencils will you have? And my son looked at his teacher and said, who cares, I only need one pencil. <laughs> <laughs> so Drew, we were watching a basketball game. It had to be an IU basketball game. And, um, so I, I said, well, hold on one moment. I said, hey, Drew, what is the score? He said, 62 to 50. I said, how many are we down? He said, 12. I said, why are we down by 12? He said, we're only shooting 38%. I said, I don't think this four-year-old has a problem with math. <laughs> All right, I think we have a relevancy issue. Things that really matter to kids. And we can take math, and they, help, they understand how math is critical to solve real problems, things that really matter to them. There's a relevancy. And all of a sudden, kids get excited about these disciplines. Kids want to take more math and science, not shy away from it. Now, that's what we really try to focus. And then we're project activity-based. We want students doing this work. It's not enough just to teach equations. And if the only thing we can do for our students when they ask the question, when will I ever use this again, the, if the best answer we can give them is that because it's on the test, right, we're doing them a disservice. So it's making these connections absolutely critical. And that's really at the core of PLTW. So I'm going to go back to 2001. 
I was a high school principal, and I was introduced to Project Blue Way by Terry Schultz, who is our director of school, senior director of school engagement for Indiana. And at the time, we had a lot of kids dropping out of high school, and many others that we believe were graduating unprepared for the realities that faced them, even if they received a high school diploma. We put in PLTW and hired a couple teachers to come in. Within a year, we had almost 400 students in Project Lead the Way, and it doubled over three years. It was that time in 2001, 2002, I really believe that this had tremendous promise to not only engage students, but to transform education. And when I had the privilege to become CEO of this organization, we really looked at this as a broad vision. How can we take this work to scale? You know, over the last two years, we've grown by nearly 60% our organization. We moved from New York to Indianapolis. We're now headquartered here in Indiana. We're very proud of that. And, but we have one mission, to provide as many students as possible this kind of work. So why does it matter? Here's why it matters. Across America today, we have 20 million people unemployed or underemployed. 20 million, yet we still have 3.7 million jobs unfilled because employers can't find the skilled workers to fill them. By 2018, we're expecting STEM-related jobs to more than double in growth over non-STEM jobs. In Indiana alone, we're expecting by 2018, we'll have 123,000 STEM-related jobs to fill. Employers are making decisions where to expand their businesses, where to relocate or locate based on a skilled workforce. The things around economic incentives aren't enough. They need skilled workforce. They need problem solvers, critical thinkers, collaborators. The other thing we find is that it's not enough training students for a specific job or a specific skill. We need kids that can think and they use these skills in, in a significant way to solve problems. Because what happens, I'll go back to my father. My dad dropped out of high school and, and was able to get a job in a factory in the 1960s. And all of a sudden those jobs went away and he didn't have the skills that were transferable into other careers and he spent the rest of his adult life trying to find a job. We can't do that to our kids today. We need kids that can grow with our companies, that can help our companies grow, that can move from one technology to a new technology. And that's the kind of thinking that we are trying to create. Sean mentioned that we were just named by Change the Equation of one of only four organizations across America of high quality and nationally scalable. We're the only in-school program identified by Change the Equation. We were just named to 100,000, 100K, 100,000K in 10 initiative, US 2020, a number of initiatives that are advancing this work across America, identifying PLTW as America's STEM solution. So we really th we're starting to think about jobs. and Why is this work really important? It is about jobs. It's about our local economies. Jim Clifton wrote in The Coming Jobs War, a book that was released about a year and a half ago, that this is all gonna happen around cities and regions. Those that learn and collaborate in meaningful ways are the ones that will win. That trying to do this on your own is very challenging. So what we were looking for, the region, or a state that can embrace this kind of work, collaborate in meaningful ways, coalesce resources, and really focus on, have a vision for what this could look like for our, our students. And that's when we had started having the conversation with Sean. So what we're announcing today is a, for us it's a pilot. One that we believe, however, can be replicated across the nation. And it really means bringing a lot of people together. A lot of organizations, as Sean mentioned, leadership in a five county region, a number of organizations that have embraced this kind of initiative to announce over $4.4 million in grants that will go to schools across this region to implement Project Way in a K-12 
12 experience. So PLTW, we are the nation's leading provider of STEM education. We are, we have over 6,000 programs, over 5,000 schools in all 50 states. We're growing over 25% a year. We have currently five programs. We have our newest program, PLW Watch, for elementary kids. Primarily focused on grades K through five. And in this program, it's really exciting to see kids engage. What we know by research is that students decide whether they're good in math and science is really a second and third grade. We either nurture this natural curiosity or we turn it off. And I was in a kindergarten classroom and I had a student, he was on his iPad doing some really cool stuff. And the teacher said, now boys and girls, it's time to go home for the day. And this, this youngster looked up at me and he said, I can't wait to find out what we get to learn tomorrow. Like, you know, that's what we want our kids thinking all the time. Always thinking about learning, creating. And then we have our gateway program for middle school students. Designed nine week modules. And Terry's gonna have a session um, later today that really talks about all of this and gets in a lot more detail about our program. But the gateway program, we have a series of courses for students. And then we have three high school programs. Two are biomedical science and our engineering program. And our third program that is being developed right now is computer science. We're really excited about that, about the computer science program. We're rolling out a course next year that will align with our engineering pathway, but then a full program of study rolling out over the next four years in computer science. So that really creates that K-12 pathway. But then does it matter to, what does it matter from our student perspective beyond high school? And what we have found, we have a number of university partners across the nation that are providing advanced standing, preferential admission, dual credit for students at some of America's top institutions. So it does matter. We have universities that announced this fall that 60% of their incoming freshman class in engineering were PLTW students, and they want more. Employers asking whether students have project way in high school they don't ask for transcripts, but they want to know, how, did you have this experience? We have companies like Toyota, for instance. Toyota started a program in Georgetown, Kentucky, in which they were, they were looking all, all over for a skilled workforce. And what they said to us, they went all over the world looking for a K-12 program because the, the, high, the best they could do in any given year was employ 50% of the people that they actually brought in, recruited, and try to train people that could actually pass their rigorous assessments. So they started looking back to K-12 and they discovered Project Lead the Way. So around Georgetown, Kentucky, they started recruiting our students. And the first cohort graduated a year ago with an associate's degree, and then many of them are going on to a bachelor's degree in engineering with the University of Kentucky and Bluegrass Community Technical College, all on campus at Toyota. While these students are employed making substantial salaries. And 100% of our kids not only passed all their assessments but were offered jobs at Toyota. Then they came to us and they said, we have a problem. And the problem is this works. And our, we have a five year plan to put this in all of our North American facilities, but our presidents will not wait for five years. They want it now. We have 18 months, so it's gonna work. We rolled out Princeton, Indiana, West Virginia, Texas, and we're continuing to build out, looking at this not only as a, a K-12 initiative, but helping build a skilled workforce in our communities and our regions. And that's what we're really here today to announce and to, to collaborate with you. This is the first of its kind, and one that we think, again, has tremendous, tremendous potential. So I'm, again, we're very excited. We also have to act with urgency. Sean talked about our global competitiveness. And I think we've done some things in, around requirements of students that really won't move the needle at all. You know, for instance, we look at our math and science um, rankings, and then 
the first thing we do is say, well, we need to add more math and science. I, I would just suggest to you we don't believe that's the answer. Just adding another year of math is not going to make our students more globally competitive. It's starting kids early, engaging them in this work where they understand the relevancy in a very rigorous environment. I learned something about urgency as a high school principal. I had a young lady, and my, my rule was real simple. The students need to see me, it didn't matter what I was doing, I just wanted to see the kids. And I had this young lady, her name was Jessica, she ran in my office one day, just, I mean, she was crying, just weeping. I'm like, Jessica, what's wrong? She goes, we have to do something. I'm like, okay, what? And why? She said, we have to do something. I'm like, okay, Jessica, calm down. She said, we have to send him back. Jessica, what are you talking about? She said, I just had a guest speaker in my class. And he was at Pearl Harbor the day it was bombed. And I asked him if he'd ever been back. And he said no, that he was never able to afford it. She said, we have to send him back. I said, OK, Jessica, get to work. This young lady, said, she sat down on my desk. She picked up the phone and just started calling people randomly. Say, I need your help. Within 24 hours, she had raised $25,000. I had company CEOs calling me from airlines saying, we will send them. Right? The CEO of Best Buy called and said, here are all the video, we'll send video cameras with you. And then someone said, we can't just send him, we have to send her too. I said, we can't send her, just with him. <laughs> that would not be good. And then people were saying, well, we have to send the families. Two weeks later, Jessica, her family, and her hero, and his family were at Pearl Harbor. All because a 16-year-old girl understood urgency and got it done. I just believe we can do anything we set our minds to. If we believe in the cause, we believe in our children, we believe in a better future for our communities, we can get this work done. And I thank you for all of your commitments and your work. And then my, I want to close with this. I, I was in a fifth grade classroom not too long ago, and I was taking questions. And you know what, young kids, you know the questions they ask when you come in in a suit and tie? The first question they ask is what? How much money do you make? Right. So I said, OK, any, any questions? And the kids were kind of, and this kid raised his hand and goes, I, I have a question for you, big guy. He goes, great. I'm ready for the money question. He goes, what keeps you up at night? I'm like, wow. I looked at this young man, and I said, you do. You keep me up every night. But I want to share with you what keeps me up every night and why this work is so urgent. We can talk about jobs, economic development, workforce development, growing our economies. We're going to do it through our kids. And our kids have to aspire to something better. Not only do we have a skills gap in America, we have an expectations and an aspirations gap in America. We don't expect enough from our kids, and our kids don't expect enough of themselves. And we have to change that. But this is an email I received. It keeps me up every night. It says, hello, my name is Jesus, and I am currently a junior in Inglewood, California. I attend Nemo High School, which is a high school in the Green Dot District. I recently heard about your program and have an immense interest in becoming a part of it since I admire your goal. I am aware of this program, and I want to know if you have any PLT programs in California. If not, I hope that you can establish one here because there are many interested people like myself and we would really appreciate your cooperation to make our students better competitors and informers. I do please ask you to help my community, which is not at the highest level, have the same opportunities as others. It would be an honor to have PLW in Inglewood. I'm taking a robotics and engineering class of now and I would like to pursue a career in engineering, so I please ask you to take our school into consideration. My email is 
you have any questions, you can email or you can contact me at my phone. If you want to contact my robotics teacher, his email is. He'd be glad to receive your email, or you can call my principal. Here's her cell phone number. <laughs> Hopefully you'll contact me as soon as possible to confirm that you got my email. <laughs> this is it. That's what should keep all of us up every night. We can't get to these kids fast enough. We had people in his high school the next day. And their school is starting PLW in the fall. Jesus is going to have this before he graduates. We can't let generation after generation pass by without doing this work. And again, that's why we're so excited about this. Yeah. We want this to go well. A lot of people are looking at this right now. When this goes out across the media today, later today, and not only will it be, it will affect all the schools in this region, it will have significant reach. People all over the country will get to see this and start talking about it and start asking the question, how do we do this? And we want to be able to point back to this model and how this worked. Now, people collaborate, and that will be the message we will send. The message is not about Project Lead the Way. The message is about a deep collaboration to advance a region and the people of this region. So again, thank you for your support, for your leadership. And Sean, thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you. We will have a chance for a Q&A, including with Sean and Vince. We'll have about 15 minutes of dedicated Project Lead the Way Q&A. But before we do that, we're going to ask Sean and Vince to step out and give some press a chance to do that on their own uh, in the way that they like to do it. So if Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, and we will see you just in just a few moments. Um, what the rest of us are going to do here is to take a bit deeper dive uh, into this uh, regional opportunity. Um, you can see that it's, uh, it's a timely one. Uh, it's, we didn't design the forum around this opportunity, but the, uh, it, it turned out that the opportunity came up just around the time the forum did. And so this, um, I thank uh, all of the folks from Project Lead the Way for being here. Let me introduce first um, Terry, uh, Terry Schultz. Terry, please uh, come on up while I find your introduction here. I want to get your title right. You're Senior Director of School Engagement for the Midwest region, a region including Indiana and Michigan. Uh, after, um, after we hear from Terry, uh, we'll hear also from some uh, local teachers, local superintendents who are involved in uh, either pilots or, uh, or long-established project lead the way programs. Sir, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. This certainly is an exciting time here in, uh, in, in the region, and I'm just excited to be part of this initiative. So thanks for being so bold. Um, as Vince kind of alluded to, I've been working with Project Lead the Way for quite a while. I worked at the state level um, for quite a while, and, and I too had a couple of boys. Um, they're now out of college and working, but, um, but they were kind of bored in school. You know, they had, good, the schools were good, but they just, you know, they just weren't engaged. They, they just weren't doing anything. So when I uh, first found out about Project Lead the Way, I, you know, and I'd see kids excited, and I'd see teachers excited, and it's like, boy, this works, you know, this really works, we need to get behind this. So I'm just really excited to see this region taking such a bold approach. So how many of you are familiar with Project Lead the Way? A lot, okay, and not everyone, though. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, is kind of quickly go over our, our four programs mostly. We are, as Vince mentioned, developing a fifth program. Um, we're just in the starting phases of that, so there's not a lot of information. So I'm gonna kind of go over it a little bit quickly. The really good part, I think, is then they're gonna be the panel that really are gonna kind of bring home some real examples about what Project Lead the Way means to them and means to the students, because that's really what it's all about. So. Um, so that's where we we'll start. I, I just uh, have to mention, I'm not going to tell a lot of stories. I, I do love the story part, but, but Jason um, from the South Bend Career Academy mentioned uh, a problem that he had today when we were talking over coffee. And he said, gosh, as he says, well, the problem is I can't get him out of my classroom. So <laughs> anytime, that we, and these aren't even the little kids. I mean, these are the high school kids. So you know, anytime that we have those kinds of problems, we're, we're really on to something. So. 
All right. <clears throat> and actually, okay, and I hate to do this too, but because Sean and, and Vince both kind of covered some of this intro stuff, <laughs> I might go through some of these initial ones um, just a little bit. Uh, quickly, but, but Project Lead the Way really started with humble beginnings. Um, when I first started, when I learned about it in 1999, it was up, upstate New York, less than 100 programs. Uh, really, the goal of Project Lead the Way starting in 1997 was to be in 40 or 50 schools in upstate New York in 10 years. You know, and now we're like, you know, close to 6,000 schools in about 14, 15 years. So you can, it's, it's just spontaneous growth, just because it works. You know, it was just a model that worked. Uh, the community got behind it, just like you all. Uh, but really, it was in one school. It was some business people that said, this skill set needs to be you know, in, in all schools. You know, how do we make this happen? How do we replicate the program? And, and from my, my perspective at the state level, that's really what, I mean, there's some great programs going on here and there and little islands of excellence. But what Project Lead the Way really did was it was able to replicate. You know, you were able to kind of take this program and put it in with the curriculum and the professional development, you know, pretty consistently from one to the other to the other, and that's really important to us. So as we pilot, and you'll hear a little bit about one of our pilots today, you know, it's really important that, that this works in little schools and big schools and urban and charter and private and every kind of school that wants to do it. Um, even, you know, for our, our launch program, even after school, a museum, excuse me, museums are looking at it, so very important to us. Um, our mission is to prepare students for the global economy. And you know, we kind of all know the statistics. Um, I'm going to say our kids, I have find this all over the place, they are smart. They are creative. You know, we just bore them. We bore them in school. The, the longer they're in, the more bored they get. And they just are looking at the clock and want to get out. So again, that's when I hear Jason saying, you know, we got to kick these kids out, I hear that a lot. Um, our kids are really smart. But they, they need the relevance. They need to know why they're learning it. And then they go deep. They really do. Um, so, so how do we close the skills gap? We really start early, and we start with engaging kids um, and, and getting their hands on it. Um, you know, we talked a lot about project-based learning and the importance to this region. It's also because I've seen project-based learning that isn't as rigorous as it needs to be, and at the upper end, you really need to make sure that you're, you're engaging kids, but it's also rigorous and relevant, you know, that, that you're pushing them, because you're not really doing any favors if you're not really giving them what they need to go to the next level. The teachers are key. We have some fabulous teachers. Um, I, I think some teachers, I was just talking with the principal yesterday, and, and he, he mentioned, he's like, you know, Project Lead the Way made me who I am today. You know, it really changed him as a person. I've, I've had a lot of teachers um, who said they were ready to retirement, and now they're 10 years out. So this kind of learning, because the kids are engaged, you know, they're more of a facilitator, um, really important. But all of you who are considering Project Lead the Way, the teacher is key. You put a good teacher with the program, you're gonna have a great program. I mean, that's about as, as simple as it is. Um, it's very hands-on, real-world problem-solving, and open-ended questions. So this is what we do. And here's how we do it. So we've got three pillars. We've got a world-class curriculum. And you know, we were questioned on this because the United States isn't really known for a world-class education anymore, unfortunately. Um, but Toyota, as Vince mentioned, they really did look all over the world for a program and they came back with Project Lead the Way. And they liked the fact that the kids were working in teams and solving problems every single day. You know, they didn't need just an engineer that could, you know, just do digital electronics or something. I mean, they really need a multi-skilled person that can solve a problem. When something goes down, they have to solve a problem, know who to bring in, what to do. Um, so, so that's really been an interesting story. Of our high quality professional development, um, you know, they call it boot camp. We've got some teachers um, that you'll hear from today. Both Matt's been through several, I think, and, and, and Carolyn's went through a version as well. But it, it really, um, it's a lot of content. They actually go through our uh, curriculum like they were the students. Um, but, but the goal is, is kind of the pedagogy that they understand how to be a facilitator of learning. You know, teachers, I mean, my goodness, they do so much. We ask so much of teachers. And the kids are like, you know, they're just like sitting there passively. And you know, I, it's got to change that equation a little bit. I mean, the kids, they do want to work. They do want to be involved. And they do want to learn. We just have to figure out how to make that happen. But you know, what I love about this is that the teachers really, really like teaching this way. Sometimes it's a problem for us because the teachers will go to our training and then they want to teach another course and another course. And we call it putting all your eggs in one basket. And then if the teacher leaves, you know, it's kind of a problem. <laughs> so we, it, it's kind of nice if you kind of spread it out a little bit. But once teachers teach this way, they usually don't like to then teach the regular classes sometimes. However, I will say that a lot of teachers will change you know, as much as possible the way that they teach the regular classes. So this professional development, I think, is, is very important for a lot of reasons. 
and then our engaged network, and, and you're going to meet some of them here that are talking today, but we've got businesses, we've got universities. Um, it just keeps growing, but it really, really does take the whole community in order to make all this happen together. So I'm going to go over the, the programs then real quick. Um, we, the, the curriculum is developed by teachers, educators, industry experts, and, um, and administrators. It, it's very collaborative. Um, you know, for instance, for the computer science and software engineering, which we're developing right now, um, you know, there was a whole group of, of experts that are brought together and, and um, you know, developing it and then we're piloting it. You know, same with the launch. Um, it's a learning process. Um, you know, Kay could probably talk about when we, st when we piloted the biomedical sciences. She mentioned that this morning. We had so much curriculum in that first year. Um, you know, it, it <laughs> it's a learning experience, but then we pilot in the schools, we figure it out and then clean it up and then we, we roll it out. Uh, but it, it, it's done by, you know, educators are at the key of, of this. But then also the whole pipeline, you know, we do want to make sure that we're aligned with the university. We want to make sure that we're aligned with the business community. So uh, the great way to do it, it is project problem, activity project problem based. Um, we introduce concepts and activities. These activities look kind of the same. There are some PowerPoints, there are some lectures or some videos or somewhere where the kids have to learn some new concept, even in kindergarten, you know, they're learning, you know, new concepts. Um, and then they do some projects that are kind of the same, and then they go into the open-ended problem solving, and, and that's where they really own it. You know, that's where they really find their love of learning, and that's in many ways what this is all about. Uh, we are aligned with standards, um, national, state, county, you know, we can't align with every state, obviously, um, but we, we do align with, with state standards, state and national, next gen. And Common Core, actually on our website, we have an alignment tool where you can look up any unit or lesson or anything by any standard and all those kinds of things. We're really trying to move, you know, we know that testing is a big deal. Um, so we're really trying to help in that regard and making, making sure kids that go deep with math and science, they understand math and science um, a lot better. So what you see in a classroom is very much unlike other classrooms. The kids are active. There's noise. They're moving around. Um, you know, they're not sitting at desks facing, the for facing forward. So... Um, you have to be used to that a little bit. This is kind of our, our new diagram. Um, we're just rolling out launch. You'll get to hear about that. And actually, we've got a couple opportunities um, coming up, in, in, one in March and one in April for schools that might want to visit um, uh, South Bend um, Kennedy and, and see, see that in action. Um, we have our middle school gateway program. Um, we have you know, our two full programs at the high school level. Computer science was initially going to be a course in the engineering program. Um, as we got into it, we decided that there was just so much that the kids can learn, and it really is going to be a whole new program. So we're rolling out um, a course next year that, that can be just in the engineering program, or schools, if they like it enough, they might decide to take it further and do a whole program. Um, and of course, we're preparing them for, uh, for post-secondary careers. You know, kids do learn, they, they do kind of, you know, they're engaged in learning or not very early. They, they like math and they don't think they're good at math, you know, or science. Um, you know, part of it is, you know, do the teachers, are they familiar with math and science and how well do they like it or are they afraid of it? Um, you know, so, so we really do need to start them early. Um, we need to reach them before they kind of check out and think, you know, I, I still hear that so much, you know, females especially, you know, I'm not any good at math. Um, you know, really, they, you know, Vince kind of had a great example of, of his son, you know, at an early age, you know, not doing well, but, but when, when it's relevant, you know, he knew the score, he knew the percentages, you know, statistics, um, you know, certainly they, they do know math. So we're starting, you know, very early with these kids, you know, kindergarten, I mean, they're, they're learning the design process, they're designing a paintbrush and using it and, how, you know, how would they do it better? Um, but it, it's all, you know, built in a collaborative, uh, collaborative way, uh, they're using technology. I think this little guy here might be doing the, uh, the big bad wolf, you know, so they're, um, they're all having different materials to, to design little houses and they have a fan that blows down the houses. So, that, you know, they're learning these things, I mean, in kindergarten. And, and Carolyn, I was talking to her, I said, well, what if, we have a learning management system, so all of our curriculum and everything's online. I said, Carolyn, I said, what about um, the kids, you know, the kindergartners on the learning management system? And he said, oh, the kindergarten kids love to be on the, they, they fight to get on the iPads to get on the learning management system and to see their name in print and, and, you know, they don't want paper. You know, that's kind of the way that we're going with these kids. You know, two-year-olds will pick up an iPad and they can navigate around this, so. Uh, okay, and then we have our gateway, which is our middle school program. Um, it goes a little bit deeper. We have um, eight, uh, nine-week units. So it's kind of a pick and choose. We have a couple foundation units and then lots of others. Um, I'm anticipating we will also have one in computer science and software engineering coming down the road as well that will align with our computer science courses. Um, engineering, um, you know, this is the one that we really started with, really about getting kids, um, 
you know, not just to be engineers, but to collaborate to, to you know, the design process. Um, it's, it's really about teamwork and communication and, and using math and science deeply. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them do go into engineers, a lot of them don't. But, you know, they know what they're going to do. They have given it some thought. It's like, well, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to look at this. You know, so they ruled that out, and that's great. A lot of them do. And, and what Toyota really loves about our kids, too, they've done the math as they would. Um, you know, these, these kids persist. 300% better persistence. When they get into their AMT program um, at the university, I mean, here it's Vincennes, you know, the kids, they make, they work and go to school, they make enough money to pay for their entire degree. In 16 months, they come out with a certification, they come out with a degree, no debt, stepping into $65,000 a year jobs. And other companies are taking notice of it, but it's, it's this set of skills that we're starting now in kindergarten that really is what they're interested in. So these are all our courses. Um, we have the two foundation courses, um, Intro to Engineering Design and Principles of Engineering. A lot of specialization courses that schools can pick and choose, and then the new Computer Science and Software Engineering. So I'm going to go a little bit fast. And I want to make sure we have enough time for all these wonderful stories. But, and then our biomedical sciences, and this is really fun. I mean, healthcare is a big need, um, but what I really love also about this program is kids understand about their own health and their family's health, and it, they can so much relate to what's going on. I mean, invariably somebody's got some kind of a disease, but it, but it really again starts with a story. They start in their freshman class with a, a crime scene. Um, Anna Garcia dies, you know, she's in her mid-40s, they have to figure out what killed her. And then they kind of go through the whole course looking at, well, she died of a heart attack and they're dissecting a heart, but her heart was weakened because she had sickle cell and anemia and they're looking at DNA. You know, so it kind of takes all these pieces together. And, and the same thing with the fictional family that has a whole bunch of ailments, you know, down the road, but it's all real, you know. I mean, they're looking at diabetes, what causes that? What kind of nutritional, it, it, I know there's one example where, where you know, you have a, a, a runner and, or they have to pick like a disease and, and a sport. So you have a runner that has diabetes, you know, what, what do you need to do so that that person could, you know, could participate in that sport? Um, so just really, really think. So we have four courses, principles of biomedical sciences, human body systems. Uh, these courses are all considered an advanced science special topics in this state. Um, you know, they're vocational reimbursable, um, as are the engineering courses. So, you know, it's a lot of science. Um, you know, it doesn't take place of biology. We do cover 60% of the biology in, in the first year course. Um, but it's a lot of science, it's a lot of math, a lot of technology. And then our, our professional development, I talked a little bit about that, but that's really key. Uh, really putting um, the students in, in the, uh, the teachers in the place of the students and learning how that goes. So we've got three phases. Um, the students do have to go on our LMS, the student teachers, and do some readiness training, make sure that they're all kind of at the same speed. They go to our core training, which for the high school courses is two weeks. Um, our middle school is one week. Our launch elementary is <clears throat> a little bit different model. It's going to be uh, 20 hours of training, about two and a half days or so, and it's a train the trainer model. So one teacher like Carolyn went to our training in Indianapolis, and then she goes to her school and trains all the other teachers. So it, that particular one is a train the trainer kind of a model. Um, but most of our uh, training is done in partnership with our, all our affiliate universities all over the country. And last year alone we trained over 3,500 teachers, so it's, it's, it's really a big thing. And again, we've got partners everywhere. Um, here's just a few of them, but you know, more and more every day it seems like are really jumping on board. So it does work. Um, I've, I've got some information out there on you know, some research that's been done um, on our program. Um, but we do find, you know, from Toyota, from other people that, that do dissertations and, and other research, we have actually had a big study just done in Texas and it really shows that the students do persist, that, that even the students that go right into the workforce make more money because of the skill set that they have. So um, I love this quote here um, from Trevor Green at, at Toppenish, you know, and, and this school is in Yakima Valley, it is like 100% free and reduced lunch, it's, you know, Indian nation kind of an area. And, um, and, and it's, you know, like half of their kids are in Project Lead the Way, and you know, he's, he's here. You know, why wouldn't you use Project Lead the Way? The curriculum's there, the training's there, it's ex extensive. And you know, he was the principal of the year last year. So, you know, obviously things are working pretty well for him. But we've got just examples all over the place of, of a lot of great things that are going on. So, um, we do continuous improvement. Um, we're always revise, you know, we're always, um, looking at our curriculum, how do we make it better, feedback from our, uh, our folks um, in the field, the teachers are really the ones that, that know the best. 
So I'm going to close with this one, but we are over 6,000 schools, or 6,000 programs at 5,000 schools. Um, we're just everywhere. So we're excited, really, to see, you know, this region, and a lot of people are looking, you know, we get a lot of questions, you know, how do we do this? You know, how do we go to scale? So you guys really have the region. I do want to say, just for the folks in the five-county region, um, so there's going to be an announcement, you know, today about this grant opportunity. We also, um, all the schools um, will receive information on the grants today. So those right after the announcement, all that information will go out. Um, so you should be seeing that. If you don't, I am your person. So if you're in Indiana or in Michigan, I, I work with both those states, and I don't know if we have any Michiganders here today. Um, but but if you know, I'm free to come and talk to school boards, to talk to teachers, to help you get started. Um, I've got business cards. I'm here, you know, through the duration of today. So um, please, you know, use me as a resource. Let me know how I can help. Um, you know, I can connect you with other teachers, other schools. You know, depending on what your needs are. So. I appreciate y'all being here on a Saturday morning, and I'm going to turn it over to our panel. Uh, let me introduce to you four folks who have a lot of experience with Project Lead the Way, either in the classroom or looking over a number of classrooms uh, in, in districts. Uh, I'd like to call down uh, all together, uh, if I may. Uh, feel free to move the chairs here a little bit. They're a little tightly gathered. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> but let me call down uh, Mrs. Uh, Carolyn Fletcher. Uh, who works in the launch program at Kennedy. Um, and I'm calling him down in, uh, in order of discussion here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask to represent uh, the Gateway program, Mr. Dan Tyree, uh, who is um, superintendent at the, uh, at the Plymouth Community School Corporation. Um, this, um, this is Kay Antonelli, who is the assistant superintendent at uh, Penn Harris Madison, who will talk to us a little bit about the biomedical program. And then finally, Mr. Matt Modlin, uh, who has been one of the two pillars of, uh, of instruction at Riley High School in the engineering program uh, for quite a number of years. So I have a clicker, and I have a microphone. And now you have all set. Yep. Great. All right. Uh, welcome. I am just so impressed to see all of you here. And I am going to make a note of this. There are a lot of administrators here this year. Thank you. That's showing interest in our children. Like, I just want to say thank you. Um, launch is basically a pilot program right now that they are actually going to. Is it on, Tom? Click again. There you go. There you go. There it goes. Instead of words, I have pictures. And the pictures themselves basically, I think, actually demonstrate. So, this is an example of kindergarten, which they actually were talking about. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the process. It's not the product. So I'm basically going to show you the pictures. Uh, they all have a problem, and they go through it. Uh, we had a, a gap. And the gap itself is basically application. And this program fit that gap. They are learning to apply. Third grade is in progress. Fourth grade. Vex kits, it's real life. And you can't get any better than that. If you don't teach them how to apply, they're not going to succeed. And, and that's basically what we're finding. No, I, don't, I don't need that. Uh, I don't have pictures, I have words. <laughs> I'm Dan Tyree, I'm the superintendent at Plymouth. And I started in 2008 as superintendent, and before that, I was the drama director and the speech coach of the school. And when, in my interview for superintendent, I said that uh, our science department was terrible, and our math department needed boosting, and we needed work, and I was going to get that done. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had absolutely no idea, but I had a friend at New Prairie who had a project lead the way, and so I, I went up and I, I watched the program up there, and I said, this is what we have to do. Um, and so um, I would like to just talk quickly about impact, impact on our school. Uh, the Gateway to Technology program is in our junior high, our 7-8 building. Um, we teach the uh, design and modeling in the robotics and automation, automation class, and we're getting ready to expand. We've been teaching that for, for five years now. Before that, we built clocks. 
and my son was in the class when we built clocks, and he brought it home, and I said, John, you built that? He said, Dad, that's mindless work. He was a seventh grader when he said that. That's mindless work. He said, it's a kit. He said, I, when he said we were going to build clocks, I wanted to put together the clock. It's a kit. You just stick it in and screw it in. It had nothing to do with what uh, I want to learn. And so we, the next year we started with the design class, and then we went in the robotics class, and then we went... Then we moved it to an elective program, and I, you know, I was afraid we'd go back to clocks. That, that everybody would want to take that class. No one wanted to take that class. Uh, we now average 360 students a year in those two classes, uh, which is full. We probably can't put any more without adding a teacher, and we we may have to do that. Uh, we have 42 students in our after-school robotics club. Um, and we could probably handle more if we, had, if we had another sponsor, which we'll work on in negotiations this year. Um, bottom line is, we put the clocks to bed. And we're doing work now in, in the Gateway program that is exciting for kids. Impact on the teacher, we had a veteran teacher. He's about my age, so I'm not going to say too much about him uh, being old. But a uh, veteran teacher. And he had been making clocks for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I, I just said, I walked in his room. And I said, what do you know about Project Lead the Way? He says, not doing it. <laughs> and I said, well, where are you going to work next year if you don't? And so um, he went to the training. He went to the training, and he called me. The third night of the training, I'm eating dinner, he called me and he said, thank you, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. I've never had training like this before in my life, and I am so glad you made me do this. And so every teacher that we've had go through the training has said the same thing. They don't call me, I warn them ahead of time. You can text me, email, you can do whatever. Don't call me at dinner time, but uh, fantastic. Um, let's see, the impact on the students. So this week, I just went in the class and said, tell me, tell me about the class. And here are some of the, some of the responses I got from the junior high. It's a hard class, but I like it. That was the first response. The second. Says, I built a robot this year. I had no idea that I could do that. <coughs> I really built a robot. Uh, third teacher says, my teacher says that I really understand logic. That's why my robot wins. <laughs> Fourth student says, you know, we've been doing problem solving since elementary. I had no idea what it was until I took Project Lead the Way. No idea what it was. Um, then I said, well, so, so, to some others, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Here's what I got. I want to be an engineer. It was the first young man. The next young lady, she said, I want to design cars. It's a seventh grader. I want to design cars. And she probably will. And the next young man that I asked, my dad works at a machine shop. And I want to run CNC machines. I said, you probably will. Um, then I went over to the high school because, because the kids that started in that first Project Lead the Way class, the ones that didn't get to build a clock, they are seniors now. And so I went into the class and I said to them, tell me about the products that you have you know, what, what's, what have you gotten out of this? You know, what can I say to this group tomorrow that I'm talking to and tell them? And so, this, you know, I said, I don't, I don't want to know what your grades were. I don't want to know any of those things, but I want some, I want some reasons that other people should do this. So tell me. Um, and they said, well, last year we had two sophomores qualify for the World Robotics Competition. 
asked some, some others, and, and they said, well, this year we have six students going down today to compete in the state robotics competition. And then I looked at a senior and said, tell me, tell me what's the best part? And he said, well, there are eight of us. There are eight seniors, and we've all been accepted into engineering programs next year. All eight. Um, that's the impact that it's had on Plymouth schools. It can have that on your schools. Um, thanks for giving me the time. Um, thanks to Vince and to Sean and everybody who was uh, involved in this. Terry, you too. And we'll see you on the 4th of March. Thank you. My name is Kate Antonelli, and I represent Penn Harris Madison School Corporation. And I am thrilled to be able to be here today to talk with you about biomedical sciences. You're going to start to hear a theme. And some of the theme is what you hear from Vince and what you hear from Terry and what you're going to hear from us. And there are a lot of descriptors that kind of keep coming back around and around and around. But that is what defines what you will see going on in any kind of Project Lead the Way program. You know, when you walk into a Project Lead the Way classroom, it's such a special place for students. You walk in and you're immediately drawn into the immediate. You see students working together. You see the teacher moving energetically from class or from student to student. You see project-based learning. You hear the tough kinds of questions that make kids think deeply. And you know what? It's not always the teacher asking those questions. It's the kids asking each other. You know, you see critical thinking. You see problem solving. You see all kinds of things where students discover, analyze, and define. That is truly powerful. Next year at Penn High School, we start our third year of the biomedical science sequence. The very first year, we started with nine students in the very first course which was um, the principles of biomedical science. Next year, and we're not finished with uh, registration for next year yet, but next year we already have 185 students signed up for those three courses. That's six and a half times in just going into the third year. One of the things that we see is the proofs and the numbers. Students and parents want programs that truly are effective and are going to mean something to them, not only during their high school years, their middle school years, but then in the long term. And that's what we see with our numbers. And just to kind of swing to our engineering program for just a second, you know, we've added teachers over the course of the last several years because it's absolutely imperative. Some of the things that we also see is that um, students and parents, uh, not only with the course sequence, but the fact that we hear from students, and that's the real story. We can all read the information about what makes one course different than the other, but it's what the students have to say. So as we look at our young lady who's, who's pictured up here, our young woman who's up at the top, um, she says, I never thought I would take a high school course with real life application. However, PBS, principles of biomedical science has taught me to make real world connections with possible careers through the completion of course journals. PBS labs are always interactive and hands on. It's a forward way of thinking and learning and understanding concepts. One that keeps the class focused and excited to learn. Boy, when you hear a student say something like that, that's the real deal. You know, the integration of technology and fascinating, absolutely incredible labs takes it beyond the realm of textbooks. You know, you walk in and you see that the students are not just mere consumers of information. They are absolutely integrated into the learning process. And that's what we know we have to do. We have to make our young people absolutely good thinkers who can think on their feet and be able to navigate a world that is not yet defined. One hears the word, and Terry, you've said it, Vince, you've said it, we, we're all saying it, rigor, relevance, relationships. And that certainly is the interaction that you see between 
students, between teachers, between each other. And what is so amazing as we look at the opportunities that this course sequence has to offer, the fourth year, which we'll get to go into in, um, let's see, next year's 14-15, so 15-16, is an internship where students actually will get to select opportunities throughout the community and be able to, to really work in depth in any particular area and work with professionals in the field. You know, because this does provide the opportunity for students to investigate many different avenues, the wonderful thing is we're also starting to pull a lot of different <coughs> students into the program. And that's, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to make a connection with students. Uh, we want them to be able to um, look at, for example, what is it that I'm really good at? What is it that I love to do? What is it that I think I might want to study once I leave high school or during high school? What is it that I think my life vocation is going to be? That's absolutely essential. And so what we see is in our um, STEM Academy at, at Penn High School, we have over 800 students who are involved in the STEM Academy. And that's where we house course sequences like Project Lead the Way Engineering, Biomedical Science, and oh my golly, Computer Science. I cannot wait for that one. And the fact that we're starting to be able to see the opportunities to help link our kids to. You know, the other kinds of things is that we see all of the integration. None of us in our jobs, none of us in our world of being an adult live in a silo. And not everything is a particular course where you only use that piece of thinking. And so we've got to make sure that we keep everything integrated. And that's the beauty of what I see in this area. And of course, being an old art teacher for 27 years, I love the idea of how the arts integrate with STEM, with all of these concepts, because we need creative thinkers. And that's what I see happening. Um, another one of our young women, whoop, sorry, is it the top one? Should be. There we go. Thank you. Another one of our young women, Sophia, says, I believe that taking principles of biomedical science has had a positive impact on me. Before being immersed in this class, I had not previous, previously understood the vastness of science. Just like math, it's everywhere. Thanks to this class, my knowledge of common diseases and disorders has been expanded. Do you know what sickle cell disease is? Do you know how it affects a person? Do you and can you explain what occurs on the molecular level between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? What percent of American teenagers do you think can answer these questions? Well, she says, I can tell you that 100% of the PBS students know these answers. Project Lead the Way helps kids think critically, and we want to make sure that we are helping them make identification with what their world will be at a certain point as they move through, move through life. Certainly, it encourages um, students to be able to investigate all different areas. Chris says, this young man says, the principles of biomedical science has turned me on to the medical field. This class has not only presented me with career descriptions and statistics on job availability, it has aided in holding open the doors to these prestigious vocations. What I love is the fact that he refers to a vocation, not a job. That's what it means. That's what we're all about, is hooking our students to what their life work should be. To anyone who seeks a positive challenge, this is the class. Topics are explained thoroughly and broken down to a technical level. The teacher I have has taken her time with us students, and she shows her patience daily. Just do not be fooled. This course is no cakewalk. You must be serious to succeed. You know, we know that the area of health and human services in the U.S. is one of the largest expanding areas of need in, in um, the world and the U.S. in the world. And we want to help our students make a solid connection with what it is they're meant to do with their lives. 
Certainly Project Lead the Way helps kids step up to the challenges, work hard, and find great validation in their potential. I've seen this coursework help kids believe in themselves and to be able to accomplish things they never thought was possible. And that is truly a beautiful thing. And so I'm pleased, I'm so pleased to get to share these thoughts about the program and about the opportunities, but also about what you see in a student's eyes when the whole idea, the whole world is open to them. And so I thank you very much. And I'm going to talk to you. My name is Matt Modlin, and I have been to five of those boot camps that uh, Terry was talking about. They are really intense, two weeks. My very first uh, exposure to Project Lead the Way was uh, in college, and I thought it was a wonderful program. And uh, when they said that they were going to add it at Riley, I jumped at the opportunity. I just had to talk my wife into letting me go to one, because it was our, uh, actually our honeymoon uh, was the week before, and we actually arranged our honeymoon to be able to travel to uh, uh, Duke University so that I could go on to this Project Legal Aid training. So um, I'm really pretty dedicated and really exciting program. Um, so I've got some slides here. And I wanted to show some of the projects that the students do because it really kind of shows the application. We talked about the, uh, the collaboration between science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, this is one of the very first projects that our freshmen do. This is 3D modeled in Inventor. Um, the students go through, they get a little drawing like this, and you can see the 3D model that they end up with. The sophomore year, this is just one example of some of the exciting projects that go on. These students actually take, they get the several different colored marbles, and they had to design a hopper up here, and they dump the marbles in the top. There's a sensor here that senses color, and it sorts the marbles by color. And this is all student built, you can see their uh, hopper is custom built. They have these little pieces and there is no plan for this. They get this box of materials and they say, build this. And then they have to do the programming. So here's an example of some programming that the students have done to actually sort those marbles by color. Uh, junior year, we have some choices. This is an example of our digital electronics class. Um, they have to uh, take that little seven second display there and make it display their birthday. And they have to design all of the logic in these chips. There's no programming there. They're connecting wires to logic gates. And it's making that display that. They, let's see if I can find the little switches. The logic switches are actually on the other side over here. Um, and they flip through those, and it displays those different birth dates. This is the uh, civil engineering and architecture class. And they talk about the project problem-based curriculum. We say design a 10,000 square foot building. So the students have to figure out, first of all, and this is probably the hard part for a lot of them, what type of building should I design? And then they have to calculate the heat loss, figure out how big of a furnace they need to put in, water pressure, how do you get the water to the building, how do you make sure that everything works on the second floor? They actually have to size the structural steel. Um, one of the, and that's really what we're getting to right now. And I can use an example here, and I, I point to the Home Depot that recently had their roof collapse. Um, I had to close for some time. Somebody needed to design that a little bit stronger. It really adds that real world part here and uh, they actually have to design the structure to hold that building up, to hold the snow in. Um, they also have to look at and talk about green design. They look at how much more water is going to run off of this site after we build this giant building on it. Are th is it going to cause any flooding later on? We're also going to make sure that the building doesn't sink into the ground, because everybody knows buildings are really heavy, and we somehow have to prevent the building from just getting pushed straight into the ground. And so they actually have to spread those out. I call them snowshoes for buildings. So they design those. And then obviously a rendering to kind of give an idea of what their uh, project is. In the senior capstone course, they have to take everything they've learned and combine it all together into a project. They answer the question, gee, I hate it when, or I wish this product could. Uh, this senior said, I hate it when I lose my remote. So he went through the design process and wanted to put a button on the TV that worked like a pager. And not only did this remote light up, but you never know when it, that remote gets way down inside of the couch cushion. So he actually made it vibrate so you could feel it in the couch so you could find it. So he really went through his uh, process to develop this, did all the electronics for it. This is an original design. This is his design 
off of the uh, 3D modeling software. This year we have somebody doing a concussion sensor. And when you go through testing, we bought an accelerometer to actually be able to measure the g-forces on a helmet. And they went through the testing process, and one of the things that they were going to do is take and make a pendulum, lift this helmet up, and let go of it and let it crash into the wall. And the kid goes, well, we're going to have to figure out the g-forces on that. And then he said, well, I learned about that in my physics class. And he starts rambling off all of these formulas about how he could calculate the forces that were going to happen when he let go of that helmet. So there's a lot of other fun things that go along. Here's some equipment that is in the class um, that go along with these. When parents come in for parent-teacher conferences, they say that my son or daughter can't stop talking about this class. It's all he talks about at the dinner table. That excitement is really what keeps me going uh, in teaching these classes. We have some students that have come back, and they say, my engineering class at Purdue was a breeze because of the Project Lead the Way courses. Current students say physics is easier because of the classes that they've taken through Project Lead the Way. And we have three sections of honors physics and one AP section. So I also look at this when I'm teaching. Remember when your math teacher taught you this formula? Here's where you're actually going to have to use it. And really in that uh, building there, we're talking about a lot of algebra. We even I touch on some concepts of calculus. I don't show them all the integrations and everything. But it's the concepts. And then the calculus teacher can then build on those concepts. So we have a lot of uh, graduates that go into engineering. And they really love it. But there are some that don't come go into engineering. And that's OK, because they've learned the teamwork and the other responsibilities that go along with being an active member in society. And they come back and they say, even though I didn't go into engineering, I would not take any other classes. I wouldn't do it any differently. I enjoyed these classes so much. The curriculum is really wonderful. A really great teacher could come up with a really great lesson and spend a lot of time on that one lesson. The Project Lead the Way Network actually spreads that out, so we have a lot of really great teachers coming up with a lot of really great lessons and combine those back together to offer a really great course. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Carolyn. All right, I'd like to pass off the mic because anyone that knows me knows I can talk and I can talk for like hours and hours. So I'm, I'm going to be aware of the time and, and try to keep us on time. Um, going back to the launch, uh, it is in pilot form. Now, being in pilot form, they are testing and retesting and testing. Uh, I have to urge you, and especially I'm talking to these administrators, you need to implement this K-12. You cannot pick and choose a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. If you want to see a full turnaround with your students, an application with your students, then you need to really look at all levels. And being a teacher, especially for the last 13 years, those programs don't exist. They did not exist. And what makes the teachers really succeed is the fact that they themselves are learners. Everything and everything and everyone needs to actually be uh, looked at in depth. You need to know where, why, and what. And you need to start teaching them by time they can talk. You have two-year-olds who can figure out your phone better than you can. You've got five-year-olds who can actually program your iPad and they're going, uh-uh, you don't have to turn that thing on. And so they're not scared of technology. You can't be either. You've got to integrate it. If we're going to compete with the global economy, then you need to start it at the kindergarten level. And this is the program that does it. They have those questions, they have those projects, and then they problem solve it. They don't just memorize and shoot it back. I mean, come on. You, they're bored. That's exactly what Terry said. They're bored. Those kids that you think aren't learning, they're learning, they're bored. They don't know why they need to learn it. You, you, all I have to say to sum it up, because I know I'm like right on time, and Tom's gonna be coming right on up, is the fact that if you want a, a culture that is going to um, problem solve and actually do it correctly, then practically the way for one. And as you heard from all those examples, they have been doing it for years. This is our first year at the elementary level. But even our first year, we have kids that are awesome. They're thinking. 
they're asking, is it, is it PLTW Day? Is it PLTW Day? No, I'm sorry, we don't have your mud yet. So they want it. It's there. We just have to actually be willing to change. I tell. It seems like fifty dollars. Recently, Project Lead the Way um, highlighted a, uh, a graduate from Riley High School, and it's in your black folder there. Uh, Keely was in our, uh, our freshman engineering program, was the very first class that graduated with all four years of uh, Project Lead the Way uh, in our magnet program. And I like her quote here, I knew I wanted to be a civil engineer after taking the civil engineering and architecture class at Riley. And she has graduated from college now with honors and is now working with NDOT she had a job offer before she graduated college. So I'd like to call it your attention to that and let you kind of read through uh, a testimonial to the uh, Project Lead Way Engineering Program. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Matt. 